Good morning, everybody. It is July 9th. I hope everybody had a happy and healthy 4th. And it is about 1120 a.m. We're a little bit late because we were talking beforehand to uh, go over some other issues related to our lovely HCM world. So good morning, Dr. Martin Marin, and welcome to Tales from the Heart again. <laughs> good morning, Lisa, and good morning and hello to everybody tuning in today, patients and, and, and family members. And the rest of them. Industry the is paying a lot of attention to us too lately. Yep. So. I get quoted back to me and I'm like, this is getting weird. Um, so today we thought we would take a look at HCM from a more maybe casual view. And that is vacationing and traveling and summer recreation with HCM. It can be a bit of a challenging prospect for a family to plan a vacation that is safe and fun for everybody and that HCM worry might be in the back of their mind. So I thought we would take some time today to ask some questions of Dr. Marin and to talk a little bit with the community and hopefully um, you can all log in and ask your questions. And I'm going to turn this down because I'm got my other phone here so I can see your questions live. Um, so we're going to take a lot of questions today about summer activity. So Marty, how often do people say like, okay, I'm planning on going away. What can I do? Is this a typical thing? I mean, I think it, it it's a fairly common question that patients ask in terms of, you know, mostly it's involves sort of two kind of categories. You know, what do, what do I think about the, 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 the patients taking, you know, trips in general, you know, big trips in general, those often mean kind of international trips. Um, and what, you know, what do I have in terms of my comments and feedbacks ab about that in general for them? And then, so, and then, of course, there are questions that are directed more at specific activities that they're considering on vacation um that rate that have a you know a range of um spectrum to them and uh want to know what i think in terms of safety for them to engage in those activities so I, i've gone through these questions myself yeah. let's take these in like some segments okay so overseas travel requires yep. typically long flights and a different healthcare system so what are your recommendations for out of U.S. travel? Not that we're doing a ton of it this summer, but who knows when this podcast will be listened to. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, one point to make just, just right off the bat is that, in, you know, in general, most patients are talking about international trips that are, in the grand scheme of things, really short time periods, right? You're talking about a week, two weeks, three weeks. Those are you know, relatively short periods of time in the grand scheme of things. It just means that, you know, the likelihood then that a patient is going to experience a medical problem related to HCM during that very short overseas trip, you know, just statistically is really, really low to begin with, okay? And so I think that's just a, an important point to remember. I think that sometimes get lost a little bit in the shuffle for obvious reasons. People are focused on, you know, obviously um, the trip and the safety right up front, but just statistically, I mean, it's a really short period of time. So um, that said, um, you know, I think that one of the important points is to just to reemphasize, you know, a number of just common sense things that could make a big difference, you know, particularly in long trips, which is that, you know, you get really dehydrated, you know, with these airplane, particularly for the airplane rides, even in non-summer months sometimes. I mean, it takes the insensible losses, just losing fluid um, is, 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 is underappreciated by, by a lot of patients, by a lot of patients. And so hydration, is really important to think about and keep up with because if you get dehydrated on those long flights, as you well know, you're going to feel worse just from that fact alone. I think, in, in, particularly in this disease with this disease. So that's an important point. Um, and then, so again, getting the right and proper amount of sleep um, leading up to the trip, maintaining hydration, um, bringing your meds with you on on the flights so that you have it available. Um, 
getting up and, 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 and of course, walking as much as you can on the flights just to kind of mobilize the blood flow and keep the body moving um, are important aspects too, in addition to avoiding you know, the, the, the risk that we all have on those long flights of, of, of a blood clot developing in your leg, you know, because you've been sitting for eight hours or more at a time. So you got to get up and walk around. That also make you feel better. So those are some common, I'll stop there by just saying those are some common, just common sense things, but they are really important and add up. Yeah. So I would add that when you are deep planning at your destination, that you take it very slow when you start walking, your body has been up in, in a pressurized cabin. You are probably, even if you're really well hydrating and you're trying, you're probably a little dehydrated. So when you get on the ground, there are worse things than missed flights or missed connections. If you try to run, you may not have the outcome that you expect. And you may be spending time at the local airport hospital because you pass out. <laughs> so don't, don't rush off of a plane. Take your time and use transportation if you need to in the train. Get on the little tram car or ask for a wheelchair if you're really struggling. You shouldn't need to do that. But don't, don't take out your vacation over your pride and not do something to make it a little bit easier on yourself. So be careful there. And you mentioned something about your, your medication. Never pack your medication in your right. case. It always stays with you. Right. Two, two terrible stories um, that I experienced. I had put some medication that was extra in my suitcase. It was stolen. My, my medication was stolen out of my suitcase by T there was a little label in there that TSA had been in my bag. Cause they can do that. My, my bottle of meds were missing. It was beta blockers. I don't know what anybody was going to do with some beta blockers, but I just threw my extras in there. So they're not secure. And it would have been really bad if that was the only dose that I had with me. Um, and number two, it gets really hot, hot on the tarmac. And if your luggage gets left out there for a considerable period of time, Yep. Your medication can go way over the recommended uh, temperature. So really try not to do that. So keep your medication with you. Yep. So now let's say you've, you've gotten to your destination in whatever country it is, and you're not feeling well, and you think you have a problem. I, ha I have some happy news here. Dr. Marin doesn't even know this one yet. We are actually working on a system through our LinkedIn community to create a bigger list of international experts in HCM that we hope to make available by the end of the year on the website right. so that you would have somebody in another country that at least you'll have a name from that we can vet to a certain degree that they know a little bit about HCM or are in contact with others in the community that can assist you. So we're working on creating that resource for you. Give us a little time and we should have that by year's end. But for now, what do you do? How do you, how do you suggest patients well, yeah. what I suggest there is, and I'm glad to hear you you, you say that. Um, I know we've been talking a lot about the the you know the updated to the website, which looks great, and I'm glad to hear that you're going to be adding information like that because that's really important. Um, and what, in lieu of that, you know, what patient in and there are patients that ask me, you know, I'm going to Italy for two weeks, if. And I understand that it's unlikely something's going to happen, but if there, you know, but just to be safe, you know, can you give me a name of somebody that if there was a problem, I could at least have a name of some cardiologist in Italy who has familiarity with HCM that I could potentially seek out. And that's what I do. I give, I, I, I give patients, you know, names of uh, cardiologists in, in the respective places that they could be visiting um, so that they at least have that, which is exactly what you are doing by providing that on the website. So I think that's a great idea. I do it when patients ask. Um, I also give it if they don't ask, just so that they have it. I also want to make the point that, look, just to step back for one other thing too, that, you know, flying, whether it's domestic or international, has become increasingly complicated and stressful, okay? Even before COVID, it was becoming more and more complicated and stressful. And we now have seen evidence of that post COVID here when people are starting to get back out, there's all kinds of craziness going on, you know, on these airplanes and, 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 and also the, 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 just the, um, the, the increase in volume of, of people flying has made just flying really difficult and tiring and exhausting. You've got to plan for that and you've got to be thoughtful and smart. 
that could take a number of different forms. It means leaving for the airport in plenty of time. It means it means maybe you want to seek out pre TSA check, you know, so you're not, you know, having to stand in these crazy lines for hours, hours sometimes. Um, it may mean, you know, also maybe it may mean, you know, if you've got the resources, spending a little bit more money to make this uh, process easier. That could be upgrading yourself to, you know, a, a different kind of uh, uh, seat um, that gives you access to lounges and all those kind of, all that stuff does make it easier on you. And you got to remember, you're, you know, you've got heart disease, and uh, this is a really stressful period. Although short, relatively, it is a period of time that can take a lot out of you because it takes a lot out of me and I don't have HCM and I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It's exhaust. So just keep that in mind. That's another thing I wanted to, to bring up. I'm going to tag on to that with a current situation. Um, so yep. after my heart transplant, I started wearing a mask when I traveled on an airplane mm. prior to my transplant and flying pretty much half the time I flew, I came back sick. I had mm. a cold, I had an upper respiratory infection, I caught the flu, I got sick. Mm. After my transplant, when I flew with a mask and I did it coast to coast, I've mm. flown six hours with a mask, I never got sick again when mm. I flew. Yeah. And regardless of federal regulation, there is something to protecting yourself and not getting sick while you travel by using a mask. Um, so I used to be the one weird person on the plane with the mask, me getting on a plane and see, I went, I went to Tahoe a couple of weeks ago and everybody had a mask on. I was thrilled. I thought it was great. So I know not everybody thinks they're wonderful, but on a plane, they make a lot of sense. Now, yes, you can take it off to eat, take it off for a little breather, but honestly, I think it's worth it long-term. And I know y'all had mask envy in the beginning and I definitely recommend Vogue masks. They're comfortable, they're soft, they're breathable and they're safe, so. I think that's a great idea. You know, we've been commenting myself and my colleagues here, you know, that that we, you know, just to expand on that point, that this last year, you know, having obviously having to have to wear masks, you know, both in and out of the hospital, never got sick once, you know, in terms of viral illnesses, uh, colds, usually I get, you know, in New England, get two, two colds, you know, winter. And, and, and that didn't happen at all. Maybe there are other factors that were responsible for that. But I think masks, you know, contribute, obviously, to, to, to preventing COVID transmission, but also all these other um, viral uh, illnesses that we don't want anybody to get, including HCM patients. So that's a great point. That's a great point. The other point I want to make too, just before I forget, is in terms of when you said when you in preparation for 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 big trips, you know the again depends on your resources and and, and how you view this. But the other, you know, component in addition to knowing where an HCM expert you know may be in the country that you're visiting, you know, there's also the opportunity, as you know too, to take out travel insurance, which you know can be used, of course, if there really is a, an emergency to make it a lot easier for you to get the kind of help you need in a foreign country. So travel insurance, for which there are a lot of different options, but that can be explored and maybe should be explored. I think that's an excellent point. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes parts of this country are like a foreign nation in terms of healthcare and access based on your health insurance company. So typically, right. if you're traveling, your insurance will cover you even if you're out of network, but you can't guarantee that. So you'll just right. want to make sure that your insurance has got good coverage in your state or what the policy is if there's an emergency while you're out of state and out of network. So these are things that right. you, you just want to know what to expect. And there's also the ability to contact your personal center from wherever you are in the in the world. You can pick up the phone and call and say, this is the symptom I'm having, and this is where I happen to be right now and take some advice from your, your personal care team rather than starting all over again with somebody in another country, possibly speaking another language and trying to explain it all. So, you know, phones still work. And that's why they have emergency lines in medical facilities so that you can ask those questions. So let's take a dive into a driving holiday or something not quite as extreme on the surface, but the destination is an amusement park whether you be hitting Disney World or Six Flags or whatever, Knott's Farm or whatever the places in your vicinity that 
you're going to go to an amusement park for the day. I think an amusement park for the day is way harder than flying overseas. <laughs> it's a long day. It's hot. There's screaming children, which always adds to things. Um, there's adrenaline. There's frustration because there's other human beings there and they're probably just in their own headspace. So you're at the amusement park with HCM. Um, what are the key things to think about? Yeah, so I, actually one of the most common questions I get asked in terms of um, you know vacations is about this, you know, amusement parks specifically, what do I think about roller coasters and it's a tough one because i you know and i think for for everybody listening you know just to be clear you know you know we don't have there are no clear studies you know that are done you know to help us to determine whether activities like roller coasters and there are also many other kind of examples in that same group um, increase the risk in an HCM patient of an adverse complication, like having an arrhythmia, um, which is the main concern that we have in terms of uh, these kinds of activities. And so there's nothing that we have concrete scientifically to fall back on to help guide recommendations. What we are doing when we are providing recommendations is trying to, we are extrapolating in large part from similar type activities um, that we know may, so, may be associated with increasing the risk of an abnormal rhythm in an ACM patient, like organized competitive sports and the adrenaline and things that, that we think are, are, are adverse triggers in those environments. And we're saying, if, it, if those kind of similar things physiologically could happen in a roller coaster, like they happen with organized competitive sports for that individual patient with ACM, then it may not be a good idea to do a roller coaster. It may so not be a good idea. We did do a little study survey based of the population on this question of roller coasters. And we published that a couple of years ago with Dan Jacoby and the team up at Yale. Um, and th that study found that from patient reported outcomes, yep. that most people did fine. But if you were really afraid of a roller coaster, the adrenaline was probably too much for you. It wasn't an enjoyable experience. Um, but I was a kid who did roller coasters with HCM and there were ones I liked. And then there was ones that were too advanced for me. So I wait on the sidelines for the really, really, really big ones. And I do the moderate ones. Right. I haven't done one since a transplant. Oh no, I did do one after transplant. Um, and, and you know what? It was really no different now that I'm thinking about it. But I will say the type of roller coaster is important. That's right. um, I told you about a uh, roller coaster I went on at Hershey Park yeah. uh, with HCM pre-transplant. And it has a propulsion start and the G-forces it was over a G. Right. And that propulsion, I felt the blood leave my body. And I thought I was going to pass out just at the time when you went downhill and everything changed again. But it, I felt awful and I swore off roller coasters after that one. And then I realized it was probably more the propulsion. So I did other roller coasters after that, but nothing with that forced start. That was bad. So, so, the, so the takeaway there is that is that is 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 this that we don't you know that it, there's no clear right answer necessarily. But here's what's reasonable, it, you know, to look at the ride itself in terms of the intensity of what the ride is about, and two about the individual patient. How does that patient usually feel in, with these kinds of activities? If they are one of these patients where there's gonna be a lot of adrenaline, you know, over a three minute ride, you know, that's probably telling you one thing versus if it's more fun and, you know, there isn't as much adrenaline and it's a, it's a much more relaxed, more and more relaxed kind of activity, even though it's a roller coaster, because that's just the way you are with roller coasters, then it may be more reasonable. And so, you know, you have to just be thoughtful with this situation, I think, and make the best decision for yourself based on those two factors. And there are other rides that have a lot of adrenaline associated with sure. them. And, and some of the like repetitive cir circling kind of machines um, can, can really alter your, your, your blood flow. 
I mean, they, if they're like the rotor type of thing from back in the day, I don't know what they call it now, where you're stuck up against a wall with centrifugal force and that's moving the blood differently yeah. in your body. So you, you want to be care. I almost passed out in that one too, but that was like when I was a teenager, but probably not a wise idea. And I didn't do it again because I didn't feel good doing it. So I just didn't do it. Right. But peer pressure can lead you to do something and it may have a, an adverse reaction. Yeah. And look, if, if it's a close call, you're just not sure it's probably prudent to just side on the on the on the end of con being conservative and, and probably skip something like that because the reality although these are fun i get it and and and, and people do look forward to them um even as adults that you know that it's you know you're talking about a, a, a something that that you know is not unreasonable to give up in terms of the fact that it's not essential, of course, and it's pretty short in terms of the enjoyment, you know, we're talking about. So risk benefit, if it's a close call, probably, probably better to walk away. Yeah. The, the rest of your day may not end up the way you expect either, because if you exactly. do have like an episode where you get a little faint or whatever, it just may throw off the rest of your day and you may not have fun. So, so choose that balance. Don't give up everything, but eh, stand in line with your friends and just meet them on the other side and watch their faces when they come in. Sometimes that's more fun. So you don't want to, if it ruins your day, it could ruin your trip. And um, from what I'm learning right now, because I just looked into this for my kids, we're getting close to this first Disney, you know, trip. Mm -hmm this is not cheap as i'm sure everybody else who's done it knows um and so there's you know you've given a lot of you've got taken away time and, and a lot of money in, in some situations to be at the park so you know a lot of factors to think about here yeah and you want to have fun so you you're on vacation wherever you choose to be on vacation and there's activities to do um yeah. I'm going to go over a couple of other ones other than amusement parks which we've i think laid on the table fine, but stay hydrated. Don't overeat. Don't push it too hard. Take rest breaks and only do the rides that you think that are appropriate for you. And it's okay to say no to a ride. It's not going to end the world. Yeah. Um, so we've gotten that part done. Let's talk about water sports. We'll start with the, the most hardcore first, scuba diving. Yay or nay? Yeah, yeah I get scuba diving probably second to, to roller coasters um, in terms of questions. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, here's the deal. Again, this is another kind of activity. We don't have any clear, really clear, good data, scientific data on in terms of risk. But I think the concerns are this. One, you know, you're talking about um, with scuba diving, and we're not talking about snorkeling. Snorkeling, of course, on the surface, probably fine. We're talking about scuba diving, where you're going below the surface, and you are then being exposed to, in some cases, pretty significant changes in pressure, right? Um, much higher pressures that get transmitted to your body, including your heart, and, and, and how those pressures affect your HCM heart um, is the concern here, and that that could trigger something adverse. And if there was an adverse event in a patient scuba diving, obviously that's an awful scenario to have a problem um, and to get help. So I, for those reasons, you know, I've, for, for, for scuba diving, I have really advocated that, that HCM patients not do that for that reason. Um, it just adding it up, the, 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 the risk seemed to exceed the benefit. So I, I usually discourage that. Is the other part of that, the person who's going to rescue you, you're putting them in harm's way as well. Right. So if you're, if you're struggling and you've got a buddy, that buddy then has to stop what they're doing, put themselves into your space, which you could not be the most rational person in the world at that moment. And you're going to put them at risk as well. So yes, it's you, but it's somebody else. And um, I'm kind of on your side there. There's very few things I go, mm, no, but yeah. this is one of them. Um, so let's take it from that side of the water to the other side of the water, parasailing. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I think that kind of falls, uh, you know, also into kind of the same conversation as we had with roller coaster. You know, there could be a lot of burst exertion with something like that. It's a fairly, in, you know, in, you know, uh, you know, adrenaline-inducing activity. Um, I would assume for most people, 
Um, and so I think that what I would say there would apply would be the same as I would apply to roller coasters, essentially. Jet skis. We've had this conversation about somebody many years ago, but what do you think of jet skis today? Yeah, again, I think jet skis, um, you know, a little different, maybe a little different in terms of intensity because it can be dialed down by you, you know, um, you know, as a, as, as, as the one, you know, in charge of the, the, the speed and therefore the engagement that you're doing with that, you know, so that can be mitigated and changed. Um, and so if you can do that in a way that makes it much more mild to moderate and in control and much more just enjoyable rather than intense, um, I could see that with jet skis. So there's a little bit more flexibility to me. There's a little bit more flexibility there. Yeah. I remember a little girl named Rose begging to go jet skiing many years ago. And you know yeah. who I'm talking oh, about. Yeah. I oh, got yeah. to go jet right. skiing. Yeah. Okay. So kayak, stick in your mind and you never forget them. It's just the passion that she had. Yeah. She had to. Yeah. It, was, no, it, I hear you. it was adorable. No, I hear um, you. And now she's an old married lady. No. Um, kayaking. Yeah. Well, kayaking. You know, if we're just talking about recreational kayaking and you know, not talking about, of course, competitive whitewater, you know, that's probably not what we're talking about. We're talking about recreational, right? Yeah, that, that to me is is even more, more, you know, m probably more permissible in a way or more or likely more safe than even jet ski, you know, in terms of that, because it's obviously, um, you know, on top of the surface of the water, you usually it's pretty calm, you're able to control the environment, you know, pretty well in a kayak in that terms, not a lot of burst exertion usually with that. If you're doing it recreationally, there's a lot of enjoyment, of course, that can come with that, particularly if you're doing it, you know, in a really beautiful area. So I, I would, I would have more flexibility there for sure. I'm becoming very into kayaking lately. Yeah. We like sure. it. We got sure. one. I think I need a different one, but that's okay. Hiking. Yeah, I mean, I think hiking too is 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 falls into the category of recreational activities that you know we usually say if you can keep it mild to moderate, which most people do, they're just going out for an, uh, you know a day hike to you know to enjoy themselves outside, you know, and if you feel symptomatic because you're maybe you know you're going up a big hill, and maybe it's too big an incline, you just have to stop and just take your time with it. Um, but I think uh, hiking is 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 you know for the most part fine. So again, so hydration, 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 don't go out for a big breakfast and then try to jump on a hiking trail. Right. Uh, keep, keep your nutrition up, but don't overeat because you're probably not going to have the effects that you want. And go with somebody, of course. I mean, you should go with somebody. And of course, obviously, you, you know, you should have with you a phone and, and a way to communicate if you need to, even if you're going into the woods, you got to, you got to have the ability to get help if that were to happen, which again, I think is, is obviously very low likelihood, but to be safe, you got to be thoughtful. So being the thoughtful person with the cardiac condition, you find yourself in these situations where you know, you're the one with the phone and the extra water and the whatever. And then when you're, I don't know, maybe hiking in the woods one day and you come across the police officers that are out there frantically looking for somebody who called for help, that it's not you, mm -hmm. you can provide services to those people. <laughs> Yeah. Um, which is it, most of the time people are going to trip, twist a knee, twist an ankle in the woods. Um, you're not going to have a cardiac emergency technique, you know, in, in all probability, but there's other things that can happen. So be prepared and, and don't be arrogant thinking it's going to be the other guy that has something happen to him. But if it is, maybe you can actually help them out too. So um, I love the woods. I'm a woods kid. Um, I dragged you back in the woods once and showed you some of my old hiking trails many, many years ago. I think we saw a snake too. <laughs> It's good, man. It could have been. No, I mean, there's a lot of enjoyment and peace that comes with, you know, getting out into the wilderness. There's no question. So we don't want to exclude that. We want people to get out and live their lives. So if you have questions right. about a particular activity, now would be the time to post them. We've kind of beat up these ideas here a little bit. Um, I do want to talk for a few minutes about extended periods of time in the car. Should people be getting out and walking every couple of hours if they're going to do a cross country road trip? Um, hydration, food, what do they, what should they know about long car trips? 
Yeah, I think it's the same as kind of like long airplane rides, international airplane rides. You know, you want to every at least every couple hours, every two to three hours, you know, you should stop, walk around. You know, you should maintain adequate hydration, you know, the whole time as well. Um, and, and again, yeah, I mean, be thoughtful. I, I think that the, there's no reason you shouldn't be able to do that. You just have to, you know, um, you know, do these sort of really reasonable measures. And I think it'll make the trip more enjoyable. Um, I would agree. Um, we do have a question about sailing. Now, that's one I think that can go from a very moderate, mild exercise to pretty damn intense. So what do you think about sailing? Yeah, I mean, again, I think um, you just got to be thoughtful. I, I would say that if it, it's a situation where, you know, it's mostly going to be, you know, a, a recreational fun outing on the water, sailing, um, and not getting into, you know, an environment that's really intense in terms of, the, you know, the wind and having to deal with certain complicated conditions that could be a very adrenaline inducing, then it could be absolutely fine. You know, that's a, re a mild amount of recreational activity that you should consider for sure. You just have to be thoughtful. If it's going to be, you know, if it's going to take you to another level because of the conditions, then it's worth either not doing it that day or uh, mitigating in some way. So that's good. Any other questions? Let them feed into the comment question or comment area right now. I do want to talk about something a little, um, a little, um, oh, Diane, that's a silly. Okay. I'll, I'll ask that one. <laughs> skydiving. What do you think about skydiving? And well, then skydiving, I'll I was actually going to bring that up when we were talking about scuba diving, because I think that the two are in some ways in terms of risk assessment, kind of similar. I mean, there's, first of all, with skydiving, I would assume for almost anybody that's doing it, it's a lot of adrenaline. You know, you're uh, in a different kind of pressure situation in terms of the altitude, which is quickly changing as you're going down. You know, those kind of physiologic effects are probably unknown in ACM, but may not be good uh, for an individual person. And of course, if you have a problem, it's a terrible environment. You'll, you'll deal with it when you hit the ground. Right. That's right. So that's one, you know, like scuba that I would say is probably worth skipping. I will tell you that in most of the consent forms, if you have a cardiac condition, you do right. not pass the consent process. Um, and again, you could be putting somebody else at risk, especially if you're doing a tandem jump. This is something that I have researched for other people over the years. Um, and it's, if you were to lose consciousness during the jump and you're doing a tandem, you're putting the life of the other person at risk because now they have to handle your dead weight upon landing and you might end up not in the situation that you expected. So I, I think that's kind of one of the short list of things that we should probably be passing on. Now, the other question on this is zip lining, and that's a different situation because it's individual you're attached, you're going to get to the bottom. So maybe it's a little bit different. If you need to get that yaya -ya out and, and check that box, maybe it's an alternative. I don't know that I would do it, but agree. Yeah, I think you have to assess that as an individual too, like you do with roller coaster. You know, I mean, if it's not going to be that adrenaline inducing for you, it's just kind of more fun. Um, I don't see a reason that that would necessarily be problematic. No. Exactly. So Kathy wow. brings up a point about center of excellence care, and maybe you plan your vacations around the HCMA map and choose something that's close enough to a center of excellence that makes you feel comfortable, especially in those first two to three years after diagnosis, when you're still, you know, a little apprehensive about the diagnosis and living with HCM, that might be a nice alternative. Um, and we're adding centers um, as we speak. Uh, some more to be announced in the next month and some additional by the end of the year, hopefully. So we're growing the network and we're working on making it easier for you not only to find the highest level center of excellence, but we're working on something that might help find other providers as well. Once we, Marty and I are working on a project, which is like hub and spoke education, we may be able to take those individuals in the community and add them to a list of educated individuals because they partake, part, participated in this education project process. So that could be really interesting as well. So the one thing I wanted to say about vacationing with HCM 
from both sides of this, being the family member of somebody with HCM or being the patient with HCM. It's okay to say, no, I'm going to sit by the pool. You guys go for the long bike ride out in the middle of a, a, you know, a hot field or wherever they're going to go and to do it, to split up and let the people who can do these other activities comfortably do them and allow yourself some other type of vacation space, which is peace and quiet sometimes, which has its value people. So I don't want people to feel left out of something, find an alternate. If they're going someplace, that's just not something that you feel like you can do or that you will be having fun at because you're going to be struggling so much, find an alternative solution that's something more up your alley for that time. And it's okay not to do every single activity as a group. You can go off and maybe split the group or do something on your own. And you should feel fine about that and find some peace in doing it your own way as well. So. And, and, and if, if I can, one other additional thing, comment that I was just, as, as you were as speaking, I was just thinking about is, 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 is an area that comes up to is skiing. Mm comes up quite a bit, I think, too. So a couple points about that. I think, you know, one is that, you know, when you're talking about, first of all, going from the East Coast at sea level out West, whether it's for skiing or not, you know, the change in altitude, as you know, and you've pointed out to me many times, can really hit an ATM patient hard. And... You froze up a little bit there. Okay, I could hear you, but you froze, but you're fine. Yeah, so that, so that you really gotta be cognizant of just transitioning with that kind of situation, sea level to altitude where, you know, you, you may have to just take it easy, you know, maybe a day or two more than, than the person that you're going with who doesn't have HCM. And then of course, the other thing is to hydrate even more than you would normally because of the fact that you get really pretty dehydrated at, at altitude like that. So you got to really listen to your body and be thoughtful um, when you're <clears throat> changing altitudes like that. Um, and also, you know, in terms of skiing itself, you know, it's got to be, you know, you, you know, there's a lot of variability in what one could do in that activity, of course, you know, just obviously, you know, there's a difference physically, no matter who you are, when you're doing moguls versus a blue, you know, and so I don't, I don't think we can say absolutely no, you can't ski at all, because the skiing encompasses a huge diverse spectrum of potential physical activity levels. So I think you've got to just remember, like with everything else, it's got to be mild to moderate in intensity, at peak exercise, as I usually like to sell patients, you should be able to have a full conversation if somebody was next to you without straining to complete words. Um, and that, you know, that may mean that you can do a blue with, you know, whoever you're going with without any problem. Um, may, maybe it's just staying with green um, and, and so forth. So you got to individualize it because everybody's different there. I'll add the summer twist to that water skiing. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the same kind of thing as is 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 kind of you know these roller coaster you know situations where there could be a lot of burst quickly in adrenaline and intensity. Um, I don't water ski. That's my sense of it in terms of particularly initially when you're coming out of the water and you're getting pulled pretty quickly and you know obviously it looks like a lot of fun, but there can be a lot of intense physical uh, work and adrenaline associated with that where it would seem most people. So I think that that could be a problem area, but I, I think you have to individualize that. Okay, those are all reasonable. So uh, Doug Greeny has popped in here and he really wants to scuba dive and that's his choice. Um, but he also said that he finds riding an e-bike helps him keep up with everybody else on the biking. And yeah. so there, there are alternates and you can look for these now and they're becoming more and more affordable. Um, so definitely e-bikes are, are something to think about. Um, I'm going to wrap up with two other comments and I, we have to end at noon because I have a call with our buddies overseas, um, not related, uh, but asked early on. So I'm sorry, I'm not getting this until the end and I hope you're still listening. Um, I was asked about the availability of Rhythmadan in the UK slash Norpace in the United States. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're in an outage. There's nothing to be found in the world right now. Um, the European market is dried up. There's some maybe small supplies left in France. 
Um, Sanofi sold the rights to another company in Germany. They have not produced anything yet. Pfizer owns the distribution rights in the United States. They have been on back order since October of last year and outage effective June 30th, 2021, because that was the last batch that was made. It expired on that day. So if you have it in your cabinets, you're taking expired medication um, and that's at your own risk. Um, and there's nothing left in the United States right now. So everybody who is on Norpace CR or Rhythmodon Retard in the UK, you're looking at taking uh, generic disapyramide now and you will have to talk about your dosage with your physician as to what's appropriate for you. Um, I've seen dosing of upwards of four times a day, typically three times a day, and you're going to have to work with your team to find the right dosing for you. Um, highly disappointing that we are in an outage. And I've been talking to people at FDA. I know I've been talking to people in Italy who are talking to their governing bodies in terms of what can a country do when there's just literally nothing left? And there's actually not a lot of recourse to make a company make a drug, which is a bit of a problem. You know, we're well, why don't you, yeah, I mean, well, why don't you tell everybody that, you know, that, that you know, just to expand on that point, because I mean, I get asked that about, about that and, and, and you should, you should just take a second here for the record to tell everybody that we, meaning you and I think I was helping yeah. did the last time there was a shortage you we can. had multiple discussions with okay. Pfizer representatives right okay. and I believe the take-home message from that was you know what was this we we meaning Pfizer are not obligated in any way legally or otherwise to inform patients or their providers that there's going to be a shortage of the drug, to provide a replacement drug if there is a shortage, or to inform you when that shortage will be over, or whether they intend to or not continue to produce the drug. We, the drug companies have full reign there. They are obligated to provide no no information about those issues we have correct, was that, is that a correct summary slightly they do have a reporting requirement to the fda when there is a shortage or when there is an outage but they are not required to disclose to the public why right or they can estimate a duration but literally they it, there's no science is obligated to keep to that right no. so there's no recourse if they were to go beyond what they project there right right nor are they obligated to provide a replacement therapy for the for the patients right nope they, they don't, they're not required to do pretty much anything right um so i've i've reached out to pfizer a number of times during this process um and they've they have been communicating with us when they and notice to the FDA, we're, we're getting copied on it, that it's out now, or this is what they're expecting. And the new date is January 2022, when they think it might be available again. Um, European system's a little bit different. And when they go into shortage, they can be fined for not producing the drug that they said they were going to produce. Um, so, you know, I, I, that doesn't have any value to the patient. Finding them isn't going to make the patient feel any better or give them access to the medication. So there's supply chain issues. And I can't say much right now other than um, I have been communicating with some rather high level individuals who are looking at these supply chain issues. I'm talking government agencies and up to the highest levels. Um, there has been you know, some, some movement here that there's a problem. Um, and that cardiovascular drugs are part of the problem areas. So we are, we're, we're trying to engage as best we possibly can to ensure that the patient's voice is at the table when they're making decisions on these particular issues. So it, it's a major issue. Um, I know not everybody sees everything that we do every day here at the HCMA, but I assure you, we are talking to government agencies. We are trying to advocate to get the care in your hands and in your physician's hands every single day in some way. 
Um, so stay tuned for more information on these initiatives and how you might be able to get involved as a volunteer committee member to help us solve some of these problems, but we're, we're just getting that kind of organized right now. So um, I will leave it at that uh, in terms of the NORPACE issue. And I will remind you all that the HCMA launched a brand new website two weeks ago. So two weeks ago, I got a brand new website and a brand new great nephew. Um, and some of you were live with me when I found out that I had it. So I apologize for crying in the last podcast. But Xander was born and I was very excited. So um, stay tuned for the adventures of Xander and Aunt Lisa. I'm sure there'll be some interesting chapters there. So I hope you found the uh, session here today informative and helped you plan your family vacation or give you some things to think about. Dr. Marin, I thank you for your time and attention today. And I look forward to speaking to you very soon about that issue that we were talking about earlier. Sounds good. No, sounds good. Have a good weekend. Always good to chat. Look forward to the next time. Likewise. Talk to you soon. Thanks, okay. everybody. Bye-bye. Right. Thank you for listening to Tales from the Heart. For more information on HCM, we encourage you to visit our website at 4hcm.org. Join us online for the conversation on our Facebook page or in our private group. Facebook page can be found at Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. And our Instagram handle is at for HCM Warriors. That's the number four HCM Warriors. Follow us on Twitter at 4HCM.org. For those members of the LinkedIn community, you may want to follow the conversation on the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association group. Join us today. To contact the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association, you can call 973-983-7429. You can email us at support at 4hcm.org or visit us online at our website, 4hcm.org, and send us an email from there. The Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association is located in New Jersey and operates on East Coast time. We would like to thank our sponsors, Myocardia, Invitae, Boston Scientific, and Cytokinetics for their support of this program. Please remember to sign up for the HCM Strong Tour, Big Hearted Warriors Unite. Our virtual tour will begin September 3rd and include dates September 17th, October 8th, October 10th, October 24th, October 29th, November 12th, December 3rd, and December 10th. A few other events will be added. Check the updated registration information at 4hcm.org. Hope to see you at one of our upcoming meetings. The HCMA is partnering with Myocardia, 23andMe, and others to help learn more about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Learn more about these initiatives at 4hcm.org. Invitae, a genetic testing company and a sponsor of Tales from the Heart, is proud to provide free genetic testing to families with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Please learn more at 4hcm.org. Hey, we know life with HCM can be challenging and support is critical. That's why the HCMA has created an online support group system to help you and your loved ones live better with HCM. Join us. The HCMA is seeking volunteers on a number of different projects, including our online support group system, our peer-to-peer, -peer, Big Hearted Friends system, and our legislative subcommittee. Please visit 4hcm.org to learn more today.